It's midday. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to the news here on 3FM 92.7. We're coming to you live from our studio at Adesawe Kanda here in Accra, also live on our numerous affiliates across the country, around the world. We're streaming live on 3news.com. Download the tuning app from the Google Play, Apple iOS Store, and listen to us on the go. Coming up this afternoon, academic activities across all 46 public colleges of education grind to a halt as teachers begin indefinite strike over conditions of service. We take you to some campuses to gauge the impact of the industrial action. Still on the front of Labour, the Health Ministry has had calls to recall all doctors on leave to resume duty. A strike by physician assistant takes a toll on healthcare delivery. Also this afternoon, no signs of a slowdown for rising food costs following mid-year budget statement by the Finance Ministry. The Peasant Farmers Association say cost of production has increased by more than 50%. And much later, we hear from the Chief Justice of Ghana, Her Ladyship Gertrude Tokun, who's been stoking controversy over the conduct of would-be lawyers and processes to be called to the Ghana Bar Association. I was surprised at the fury that rose up concerning the call to the bar of certain people. And I thought, like, seriously? Details of these stories and a lot more if you stay with us for the next 30 minutes. Pleasure that you could be a part of this afternoon's bulletin. It's streaming live on Facebook, 3FM927. Same handles on Twitter as well, 3FM927. I am Eric Mawina Egbeta. Let's settle for the details now and academic activities across all public colleges of education in the country are expected to be affected as members uh, of the Colleges of Education Teachers Association of Ghana begin a nationwide strike today. CTAG on Monday announced a withdrawal of services by members effective today of a government failure to implement the National Labour Commission's arbit arbitrary award order and the negotiated conditions of service since the 2nd of May of this year. Yes, Prince Obin Hima, his president of CTAG, declaring a strike at a news conference. That effective Tuesday, 1st August 2023, all tutors with emphasis, all tutors of the 46 public colleges of education in Ghana are to withdraw teaching and related services until our employer has complied with all the orders of the NLC. No retreat, no, no surrender. No retreat, no, no surrender. We want to serve notice to the government that enough is enough. We have gone through this suffering for far too long and we believe that the college teacher deserves better. So that's Prince Obey Himang who announced that industrial action uh, yesterday would take you across the country to gauge the mood and pick thoughts for you here on the news. We'll start off in the Ashanti region and uh, where my colleague Ibrahim Abubakar has visited the St. Louis and Wesley Colleges of Education there and reports that the industrial action has begun to already take a toll and then we'll take you to uh, the northern part of the country where Christopher Marqua as well is on standby with a lot more details and seek to get an understanding of what the situation is like but you're listening to the news you're on 3 fm 92.7 or streaming live on facebook uh, handles 3 fm 927 uh, in the ashanti region quite a number of the students as well have been speaking uh, to us christopher marco i understand has joined us on the telephone line uh, with some details uh, chris you've been to some of the schools talk to us about the impact of the industrial action yes so uh Marina, um classes uh, is not going on in uh, the two teacher training colleges that are visited in the Tamale uh, Metropolis, that is the Baga Baga College of Education and the Tamale uh, College of Education. Students were idling about when I got to campus, and some of them have been telling me that um, this is actually uh, going to impact negatively on the academic activities because from the same time last year, uh, the uh, tutors were on strike, and it did affect them, and if they are going on strike again. The number 
of contact hours they have lost and are going to lose is going to really affect them. So they are worried. They are worried, but did you come across any of these uh, teachers and pick thoughts from them? What will make them return? Okay, so uh, they just said that they are on track and government knows uh, their demands and until their demands are met, they are not going to return. Uh, for them, this is not the first time they are making uh, such demands and that uh, uh, so long as government is not ready to listen to them, then they will continue with a strike until such a time that uh, their demands will be met. Right then, Christopher, many thanks uh, for those details. That's Christopher Marco, my colleague uh, there, and we'll be touching base as well across the country in the course of the bulletin to get a sense of what the impact of the strike is like. But still, on the ongoing strike or on the labor front, this time uh, with relation to the physician assistants, they have their strike have begun to take a toll on healthcare delivery at some health centers across the country and government is racing uh, ahead of time to seek to resolve their grievances. The National Labor Commission is scheduled to meet members of the group today to discuss their concerns, but they remain adamant in calling off the action despite assurances. Three of them has gathered the Ministry of Health is equally distressed uh, with the development recalling all doctors on leave to resume duty to mitigate the effect of the strike. The health minister, we gather, is also scheduled to meet with a striking graduate physician assistant at a latter date. Isaac Ofe uh, is the public relations officer at the uh, ministry who join us live uh, with a bit more details and get an understanding because with the health minister seeking uh, to meet them, the NLC planning meetings, it presupposes that some headway uh, is being made in relation to their grievances and the expectation is that they can call off that industrial action. Uh, we'll get on the telephone lines. Isaac Ofe is the public relations officer of uh, the health ministry, rather, and uh, get thoughts for you here on the news, 3FM 92.7. We're streaming live on Facebook, uh, handles 3FM 927, same handles on Twitter as well, as we await to connect uh, on the telephone lines to some other matters uh, that have been quite topical uh, following the presentation by the finance minister yesterday. And be ready for a lot more difficulty within the Ghanaian economy. That's the verdict of experts who have been reacting to the details as captured in the media budget review as delivered by Finance Minister Ken Oforiata. Notable among the issues have been revised growth projections in both GDP and oil GDP. And Michael Obodu, he's been detailing the key issues from the presentation. Food inflation, which indicates the rate of price change year on year for June, stood at 54.2%. The impact of inflation was further highlighted in the World Bank 2022 report on Ghana, which indicated that the phenomenon put some 850,000 Ghanaians into poverty, while 7.7 .7 million Ghanaians were labelled as food insecure, with the numbers expected to remain high throughout 2023. Despite these concerns, the government reviewed its inflation target for the year upwards to 31.3% from a previous 18.9%. End period headline inflation of 31.3% from 18.9%. Primary balance on commitment basis of a deficit of 0.5% of GDP compared to a surplus of 0.7% of GDP aligning with IMF supported primary balances. Gross international reserves sufficient to cover at least 0.8 months of imports of goods and service by 2023. Even though the finance minister indicated that the country's economy had turned the corner for this year, he announced a downward revision of the growth target for the year. Mr. Speaker, key revisions to the macro fiscal target for 2023 year include one, overall real GDP growth rate of 1.5% down from 2.8%. Non-oil revenue GDP growth rate of 1.5% down from 3%. The World Bank had, among others, proposed policies to enhance the agricultural sector as a means to tackle food inflation, and it appears the government took heed to some of the suggestions. After a comprehensive review, government is finalizing PFG Phase 2 to ensure a more efficient and targeted support 
for the agriculture sector. The key elements of phase two are inputs, credit systems, storage and distribution infrastructure, commodity trading, and digitized platforms. Many had expected a review of some taxes in the media budget review, like the e-levy, the COVID-19 levy, especially as the World Health Organization had announced an end of the pandemic, a scrapping of taxes on sanitary parts, among others. But they were left disappointed as the finance minister was silent on these issues. Maybe an indicator that desperate times do require desperate measures. Michael Obudu, with that report, we put all of that to a cross-section of you to react to. Here's what you've been telling us. I was hoping that the, the tax on sanitary pad could, um, could have been abolished or should be abolished, which they didn't take into consideration after the protests and everything. Because sanitary pad now has become very expensive and people find it very difficult to you know purchase and even those buying now it's becoming a problem because you see some people have to buy like two or three and it's coming very very expensive so i was hoping that could have been done just to ease a little bit of pressure from we um females or women basically i was looking at having them reduce taxes of the parts and um, I'm saying the parts because I'm a female and uh, I've seen the stress that I had to go through having to purchase um, menstrual towels that are worth too much than they were in the past two years and then looking at that as well looking at the fact that actually there are no taxes in the budget maybe it's good news to some of us I believe that every country needs tax to run the country but um, with the COVID tax I'm um, I'm of the view that it should be abolished because now we can say that uh, the COVID has a bit uh, uh, calmed down and it's not in the system again. And moreover, to I think that um, with the COVID, we say goodbye to it in Ghana now. So when you go to the airport and things and you buy items and you check the the receipt that is printed to you, you realize that uh, COVID tax and those things is, is, is heartbreaking. WHO has, has declared that the uh, COVID is no more a pandemic, and so I was expecting that the, that tax could have been scrapped. I don't understand why there is no more COVID, but I'm still paying tax. When you go to buy the restaurants, I'm still paying those tax. So I think I was expecting that the government was going to scrap such a tax, and th there are a lot of tax on us already. I mean, as a, y a young person on social media, I'm not, I'm not being taxed if I want to do ads on social media, etc. And the government is taking a lot of tax. Of, of course, we admit that we need to help the government build the country through taxation, but sometimes the taxes we paid, we pay for we pay are not accounted for and that is why most Ghanaians are not willing to pay their taxes. A cross-section of Ghanaians but amidst all of the uh, hard number crunching though has been the concern of even more rising food prices. President of the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana Charles Nyaba says a more than 50 percent increase in farming costs could have negative impact on the Ghanaian economy. So we were hoping that at least with a new review then we'll see new investment coming to the sector. We are in the third quarter of the year, and as we speak, every farmer produces at his own cost. So the planting for food and jobs is under review, but then the review, we don't know the details as yet because it's not done. That's number one. The third quarter we are in, this is the planting season, is it not? Yeah. And you, the farmers, are farming, you are planting at your own cost. You are right. You are buying fertilizer at market price. Yeah. So, so Alfred, you see, I always want to make this clear. It's not like farmers are begging that we be supported to do what we are doing. Mm -hmm. But there are certain factors that we think that or buy the seed at a moderate cost or procure mechanization services at a moderate cost. But this year, almost we had over 50% increase in cost of production. Because, 50%? Yes. Because all our inputs for production, majority is important. And because of these duties we have that have been taken out, the cost is passed on to the farmer. So obviously we should expect the inflation you are seeing because a farmer is a business person. Mm -hmm. So if my cost of production goes out, what do you do? You can't sell at a loss. True. You push the cost to the consumer. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, yeah. So how much are you buying?
So let's get on the telephone lines in other related matters now. That's Charles Nyaba. He is president of the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana. To other stories, and the Ministry of Works and Housing has been directed to explore the possibility of disposing of the Saglemi housing project covering 1,506 housing units to a private sector to complete and sell to Ghanaians at no further cost to government. That's according to the president. And he made the statement at the salt cutting ceremony of the National Affordable Housing Program, which seeks to put up 8,000 housing units within the space of 18 months. Judith, our Chutando is there for us, joins us on the telephone lines. Uh, Judith, uh, provide a bit more uh, on the President's order to the Minister for Works and Housing. Right, and tomorrow we all know that the Saglangi Housing Project initiated in 2012 was to deliver um, 5,000 housing units at a total cost of $200 million. But um, at the end of the stipulated time, we had only reached about 1,506 um, units. And even that was done at 98% of the total cost of funds that was projected for that um, housing unit. Now, we also know that um, that housing unit, the number that had been reached as 1,506 housing units, we did not have um, water, electricity, and other related amenities. And so what government or the president is saying currently is that upon feasibility studies, they realized that there was a there was a need for 46 million US dollars required to uh, for provision of quality infrastructure, that water, electricity, and then some drinks. There was also an extra need of 68 million um, US dollars that was required for the completion of the 1,506 housing units and other works on the buildings. And so the total additional investment from government was approximately. 114 million US dollars that was needed to complete all outstanding work to make um, the 100 and 1,506 housing units habitable. And so, based on this assertion, they decided that they would, I mean, um, dispose of the Saglemi housing project to um, some private developers to sell uh, to Ghanaians so that government doesn't have to bear any more costs. So, that's what has been said so far. And this new uh, uh, housing unit, 8,000 expected to be completed in 18 months. Who's expected right. to be funding this? Right, and so this is going to be funded by private developers as well. So that is what government has said. But um, according to them, um, looking at the pamphlet here and the cost or the maximum estimated cost or, or, or unit prices for each of the apartments, we've seen a studio apartment costing 13,800 US dollars. They've seen a one bedroom um, apartment costing 20,700 US dollars. Two bedroom going for 34,500 US dollars. And a three bedroom going for 42,550 US dollars. Now, they're saying that um, these uh, amounts could be reduced by the private developers, but no one can go about this amount as uh, per what they have said by government. So, this is what um, these houses are supposed to be costing us, whether this will be affordable for Ghanaians, well, we're yet to find out, Mauna. Right then, uh, Judith Orchitando, my colleague with details. So returning to the front of labor, because the National Labor Commission this uh, has given management of Sununa Sogli uh, up to 24 hours to make a decision or take a decision to reinstate the three dismissed union leaders based on that the trades union congress has begun inciting its members to remain resolute and wait for the call to reactivate the organized labor strike which has been currently suspended deputy secretary general of tuc joshua Ansa, has been addressing a news conference when we were called to that emergency meeting you came in your numbers and that emboldened the organized labor to know that Yes, we are ready to fight for our rights. Comrades, we are not relenting. We are going to fight until our demands are met. So I want to add my voice to the call by the General Secretary to our distinguished and able men and women in the, um, how do you call it, the Council of States. In the Council of State. I know they are working. I know they are working. I know they have worked to a certain level where the state actors are working, the ambassadors are working, the chief of staff is also working with the top hierarchy. But because we want results, because the results are delaying, comrades, we want results and not processes. So I think that the call on your, from your general secretary 
it's timely, and it's worth calling. It is our hope that tomorrow when we meet with the National Labor Commission at 2 o'clock, something positive will come out of that. And our, something positive. And the positive is that our three brothers are recalled back to work. And matter closes from there. When I listen to the issue. So that's Joshua Ansa. He is the Deputy Secretary General of TUC. And we're moving away from this. And the Minister of State in charge of finance and economic planning, Dr. Mohamed Amin Adamanta, served notice government is seeking to enhance the electronic transaction levy, popularly known as e levy, to collect more from the public. He says government has been disappointed with the performance of a tax regarded as important. As a result, efforts are to be put in place into making it more efficient since it constitutes an important revenue source for government. Uh, banks do lose. Mm. Okay. And as I speak to you, the Bank of England has lost about 150 billion mm. pounds sterling mm. that the British government has to come in to, to support them. So they do lose. Mm. And there may be reasons why they, they, they lose. We embarked on the DDEP, okay. and you know that the DDEP has created uh, uh, liquidity problems, mm -hmm. you know, as well as solvency uh, problems in the local banking industry. Government is aware of that, and this is why I said earlier that economics is about trade-offs. That's the Deputy Minister of State in charge of finance speaking rather about the Bank of Ghana and the losses uh, which has become the talk of town. Well, moving out of Ghana and to the West African sub-region because we know that the President has been calling on the United Nations and ECOWAS to take immediate steps aimed at restoring democratic rule in countries in the region uh, where there have been military coups or constitutional overthrows. The president uh, made the call when he received the uh, UN Secretary General and new special representative of new special representative or Secretary General Leonardo Santos Simao in his office at the Jubilee House. We can take a listen to the president and exactly what he's been saying. And suddenly that picture of ECOWAS as a, a, a democratic space has been uh, compromised by these events in Guinea, in Mali, in Burkina Faso, and now in, in Niger. So it's, 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 it's the biggest preoccupation we have. And how to re-establish democratic rule in these nations is a major preoccupation of people like myself. Because we think that uh, the issues of, uh, I, I have to confess, I disagree with the analysis that the, the leaders of Burkina Faso made to you, that somehow or other you can de distinguish the uh, governance from issues of security, and you can, as it were, deal with security on its own without uh, taking into account the, the quality of governance of, 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 the, of, of those who are prosecuting the battle for security. I think it's, it's a mistaken view. President Kufaro there, well, the military takeover in Niger has sent shockwaves across the West African sub-region, pitting the country's former Western allies and regional bodies against other countries in the region. On Monday, the military government of Burkina Faso and Mali warned that any military intervention against last week's coup leaders in Niger would be considered a declaration of war against their nations. Their warning came after... Uh, West African leaders threatened to use force to reinstate the GST post president Mohamed Bazoum. Let's get on the telephone lines. Uh, Mutar Mumuni Mukhtar is executive director for the West African Center for Counter Extremism. Let's do a bit more on this. Uh, many thanks uh, for speaking to us. Does ECOWAS have what it takes to really intervene to push out the military junta in Niger? Well, uh, what we are looking at. It's a very complex situation in terms of what it means for ECOWAS to execute uh, the warnings uh, they had, that they had issued a couple of days ago. Uh, to undertake that kind of exercise, you would need you know, strong willing you know, forces and alliances. You would need the support of the rest of West Africa, 
that it, you know, under civilian rule that are supportive of the declaration that was made on Sunday. And you would want to ensure that that kind of situation does not lead to mass casualty or undermine the security of Nigeria. And that possibility, I do not see that happening. And I think that uh, ECOWAS needs to take a few steps back and really look at what measures and options they have to be able to deal and contain the situation in Niger. Uh, I don't think that this warning that was issued on you know, 30th of this month uh, is, is deterrent enough to have these military leaders back down. I do not think that a sense, a, any sense of deterrence, I don't think that the coup leaders so far have shown any indication of responding to the demands of ECOWAS. If you remember, just hours you know, before the coup uh, succeeded, there were engagements with the chief of army staff of Niger, with the presidential guard, and several stakeholders, and trying to get them to succumb or to come them to stand down. That failed because these individuals, the presidential guard, knew the huge implication of engaging or invo involving themselves in the failed coup situation. And so either you make sure you succeed or you do not start at all, so in the same analogy, they will be making similar calculations in terms of, you know, the tendency to succumb or stand down relative to ECOWAS's, you know, declaration. And uh, if they, they do not stand down and engage the forces, the ECOWAS forces, mm. in, you know, combat operation, it would be a huge, huge blunder on the part of ECOWAS. It would be a huge situation of insecurity for Niger and for the entire West African sub-region. At the moment, we're already dealing with uh, an overwhelming situation of violent extremism and instability in West Africa. We are beginning to see, even in coastal states, influx of refugees who are fleeing the violence in the Sahel. We're beginning to see the biting force of the violence in terms of food insecurity here. Climate change is driving, you know, a lot of actors within the space towards coastal states, and it's impacting on insecurity and conflict in the region. And so the situation in Niger has a tendency of undermining the stability and security of the entire West African sub-region. And I do not think that that is what we want. Mr. Mukhtar, I think you've done justice to the conversation. Uh, I appreciate that you could speak to us. I'm sure we'll come back to you because uh, this is not going to end just as yet with the threats, the counter threats coming through from both uh, Mali and Burkina Faso. So I appreciate that you could speak to us this afternoon. You're welcome. That's the... Executive Director for the West African Centre for Counter-Extremism, Mukhtar Mumuni Mukhtar, speaking to us this afternoon. Let's take you to Parliament now, uh, where quite a number of development on the floor. Former uh, minority leader, amongst many things, uh, asking for the criminalisation of unexplained wealth. Kamala which is a parliamentary affairs correspondent. Let's get details from him. Uh, Kamala, what informed the comments by the Honourable Harun Idrisu? So the Somali South MP was commenting on uh, the 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 vetting and then the sub subsequent approval of the deputy special prosecutor who has been nominated for another uh, term, Cynthia Lampe. Uh, what what happened was that her her vetting was not done uh, for the Congress, but this time around because she's once been vetted, the committee took the decision to to vet her in camera, and so the media was allowed. And when this came to the floor, the members of the, the minority, especially Musa Kamuba, raised the issue about the precedent that affected that. It, 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 I mean, there's nothing entirely wrong with doing it in camera, but it may give a precedence where some other minister may be reappointed or some other official, and then they will have to do the same thing again. You know, that individual will be calling for it. I don't know if you in, a, in, in commenting on this, said that necessarily the first case is actually a classical example because if you look at it, it does it does appear that there's been so much talk about public officers who have so much wealth that they are not able to explain. He also calls for a real look at the asset declaration law where indeed it will would, it would, it would now empower certain state institutions for instance a special uh, prosecutor to time, time and again look at the assets that people have been able 
to acquire over the period because some people hide behind that and are able to get money and 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 and, and launch them into either accounts mm. or into uh, some some safe uh, safe that the students are able to have access to, uh, which which is of a classical example. So he's making the point mm. that yes, indeed, there's a need to do a, a, set, a, a law that would be able to put a criminality on it when the person is, uh, 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 the, the cameras are able to capture the person. Kamala Kruchi, Parliamentary Affairs Correspondent, will end the bulletin where the Chief Justice Getri Tokonu, who's uh, still controversy with her latest comment in relation to how persons get called to the bar. And then when somebody has behaved in a, certain, in a certain way, we say we cannot call the person to the bar. I was surprised at the fury that rose up concerning the call to the bar of certain people. And I thought, like, seriously, this is proper conduct for the, for, for the legal sector? That's interesting. Anyway, so for you to come into our space, and to come into the space of the legal sector, your conduct cannot be obscene and offensive, and you expect that you'll be admitted. It doesn't work like that. As a Chief Justice, her ladyship Gertrude Tokono and in this afternoon's edition of the Bulletin here on 3FM 92.7. As always, a lot more news if you log on to 3news.com. Now, thank you, Amensa Brampa. She's here, ready, waiting to bring us the very latest from the world of business. I am Eric Mawina Egweta. Log on to 3news.com for a lot more news. <music>to discover the beautiful sights and sounds of Joburg. Tour the most enchanting wineries of Cape Town and attend the biggest wine event in Africa. Wine X amongst many other incredible experiences. Be a part of this exclusive getaway from the 21st to the 28th of October. Tour package includes visa facilitations, return flights to Accra, round trip flights to Cape Town and Joburg, hotel accommodation, breakfast and lunch, exclusive tours of the wine lands and wine tasting in the Western Cape province, city tours of Cape Town and Joburg. Exclusive access to the Grand Wine X event at Santin Convention Center, guided shopping tours and tourist sites, and B2B networking breakfast sessions. Book your place for the trip of a lifetime. Single occupancy is $2,699 US dollars. Double occupancy is $2,399 US dollars. Special rates are available for couples. Please call 0531 100927 to be a part of the 3FM getaway. Let's discover South Africa with 3FM 92.7 and South African Airways from the 21st to the 28th of October 2023. 3FM Getaway is powered by 3FM 92.7 and in partnership with SAA and supported by TV3. 3FM, your urban lifestyle radio. Very good afternoon to you. Thank you for joining us on Business Daily and coming up this afternoon... Government sets out to restructure 31 billion cities of domestic pension funds. We will also bring you some reactions. My name is Nana Ikuya Mensa Brampa. Let's get to the details now as government is inviting holders of the domestic notes and bonds of the Republic of Ghana, ESLA PLC and Dachi Trust PLC to a debt restructuring deal that gives the state fiscal space in the medium term at no loss to the retirement funds. Pension funds have been offered to exchange about 31 billion cities of existing investments that carry an average coupon of 18.5% for two new bonds maturing in 2027. 
2027 and 2028 with an average interest rate of 8.4 percent government will also give holders more of the securities which were issued in february and an additional cash payment instrument that offers 10 percent according to the release in 2023 and 2024 both instruments will pay five percent coupon in cash and the remainder will be capitalized into the nominal amount of the two bonds and paid at maturity. Meanwhile, lead researcher at JCB Capital Courage Boti says the acceptance rates for this new offer will be much higher and there won't be much resistance as the terms appear very favorable. From the way I read it, in total, these investors will be getting or these pension funds will be getting some 18.35 and 18.5 percent on this exchange bonds and they are going rather interestingly for a long tenor an investor with a long uh, investment horizon they are getting shorter terms 2027 and 2028 and that is the earliest the ddp bonds will mature and so what is happening here is that they are getting their money back early and they are getting it at terms very close to their uh, average coupon rate on the initial bonds really so it works in their favor and that is why i think that the acceptance rate will be probably higher and there might not be so much resistance to it because the engagements have gone on in the background Courage Boti is lead researcher at GCB Capital. Finance Minister Ken Ufirata has reiterated government's resolve to support critical institutions in the private sector. This is also to support these institutions deepening their interactions with private sector to spare growth as the economy recovers. Government has established and recapitalized critical institutions that are able to provide financial intermediation to the private sector. These institutions include Gersel, Development Bank of Ghana, Consolidated Bank of Ghana, the Ghana Commodity Exchange, the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund, and the Venture Capital Trust Fund. Mr. Speaker, as the economy recovers, we need to support these critical institutions to deepen their interaction with private sector to spare growth and create more jobs. Government will place emphasis on supporting DBG capital raising to US 1 billion mark in the medium term and dispersing about a billion Ghana cities in loans from the current 450 million by end of the year. GB and that was Finance Minister Ken Oforiata. Again, government has established an export trade house in Kenya to promote made in Ghana products and services. In line with the Africa Continental Free Trade Area, government has also facilitated the issuance of the AFCFTA certificate of origin to 51 Ghanaian companies covering 300 products. Let's hear the Finance Minister again. Established an export trade house in Nairobi, Kenya to promote made in Ghana products and services. We have also undertaken a marketing expansion expedition to Kenya of 63 Ghanaian companies to introduce them to the East African market. Government has also facilitated the issuance of AFCFTA certificates of origin to 51 Ghanaian companies and businesses covering 300 product lines indicating eligibility to be traded under AFCFTA. And there was Finance Minister Ken Furiata there ending it for Business Daily on 3FM 92.7. Remember, when you log on to 3news.com, we have more business news updates. My name is Nana Ikuya Mensa Abrampa. Have a good afternoon and enjoy your lunch.